Thank you all of our participants for being here and for Scott and Johannes for being with us as well. This issue of infrastructure sharing is proving to be really popular, really uh, challenging for a lot of people. We've already had one Next Practices live session on this with uh, the regulators from Curacao and from the Cayman Islands. And so we're now we're really fortunate to have two international experts that have worked on these issues a few times in their careers to kind of give us a, a good broad perspective, both of them from think tanks or from universities. So uh, we'll have, uh, let me just introduce them, then we'll jump right into it. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Scott Walston. He's no stranger to those of you that have been part of our, our uh, Next Practices Live uh, webinars. He is a president, he's the president and a senior fellow with the Technology Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. And he was the economics director for the Federal Communications Commission in the U.S., its national broadband plan. He served as an economist with the World Bank and also served as a resident scholar with the American Enterprise Institute. Also with us is a Dr. Johannes Bauer. Uh, Dr. Bauer is a professor and director of the James H. and Mary B. Quello Center for Media and Information Policy at Michigan State University. He's a frequent contributor to our PERC training programs. He's internationally known as a leading scholar in telecommunications policy and regulation. I could go on and on about both of these gentlemen, but let's uh, actually make good use of their brains while we can. So uh, gentlemen, let's get started. Let me, let me start, and, and Scott, I'll have you lead off here with this question. Uh, define for us what people mean by infrastructure sharing. How do you hear this used so that we all know kind of what we're talking about? It, well, um, Mark, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, it's fun, always fun to talk with you and fun to talk about this topic too. Uh, so infrastructure sharing typically means uh, that one company, or it doesn't have to be a company necessarily, but there's one, one, one company operates uh, the infrastructure, the, tel the telecommunications lines in this case, for example, the broadband lines, and other companies will sell services on it. Uh, so like BT has the, will operate the infrastructure and other companies will sell the broadband service over those, over those lines. Um, the infrastructure provider may or may not offer its own retail service, depending on, uh, depending on the, on the setup. You could be a wholesale only operator, in which case you're just providing the infrastructure and you're selling to, uh, you're, you're selling to other companies who do the retail or you can, you can do both. And then there are, you know, there are broadly two different types of it. One is where the operator willingly shares its infrastructure. And this happens all the time. Companies, wireless companies make roaming agreements with each other. That's infrastructure sharing. Uh, sometimes they're not even roaming necessarily, but where there are holes in their wireless coverage. Or sometimes um, even wireline companies will uh, uh, let others retail, uh, sell retail services. And then there's the case where the, uh, where the regulator tells the, uh, tells the company that they have to share their infrastructure. And so the differences are, you know, one is a marketplace negotiation, the other is the government telling them. And, 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 and then of course, the, what matters is how the prices are set, because if the, if the company itself decides to do it, it sets the price. And if the regulator says it, then there'll be, uh, you know, the typical regulatory negotiations over what, what the price will be. Uh, so I think, that's a, I think that's probably a pretty good um, positive definition of, of, of infrastructure sharing. Okay, thank you. Johannes, what would you add? What else have you heard? Yeah, so let me maybe uh, uh, generalize what Scott said, which I agree uh, wholeheartedly with, with his points. I would define infrastructure sharing as, uh, in general, as, as a model where either active or passive uh, assets that are needed to provide a service are shared. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, all the examples that Scott gave, I think would fall into that, uh, uh, that definition. Uh, infrastructure sharing has gained a lot of uh, attention recently, right? Because we, many, many regulators, many uh, managers worry about the, uh, let's say the deployment of 5G networks, which uh, given the technology that is being used, uh, raises sort of uh, uh, challenges, uh, especially bringing in uh, small cell configurations to sparsely populated areas. But infrastructure sharing has been with us literally almost since the beginning of, of the telecommunications industries, uh, if, if one uses that generic definition, right? So for example, uh, let me just go backwards in time a little bit, right? To give you a couple of examples. One could say, uh, argue that um, 
unbundling policies, for example, right? Uh, again, they fall right squarely into Scott's definition of a, of a regulatory mandate on, on the incumbent provider to make access to its uh, infrastructure available is one form of, of, of network sharing. Um, you go back, uh, let me give you just one more example in the United States, and the same existed in the country where I grew up in Austria. Uh, you had you had a party line uh, service, right? Where four people uh, or or two people would share one uh, main telephone line, right? It's essentially, those four people could listen in on each other's calls. But it, the same, you know, the same idea to spread the cost of uh, of of active and uh, and passive assets needed to provide the service among a, a number of users was being used. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both very much for that. So that kind of sets where we are. Um, it, it's a sharing of facilities, whether that be active or, or passive, and that has to do with what the, the technology is like. So let's, let's now talk about um, kind of the motivations for it. Sometimes operators do this voluntarily. We had the CEO of uh, the Bahamas Telecom Company talking about in dealing with disasters, they're going to be doing a lot more infrastructure sharing than they had done in the past, but this was all voluntary. It wasn't that the government was mandating it. So sometimes operators do that, but there are other times when they, they don't. Um, you know, based upon your experiences, tell us a little bit what you believe are the reasons why um, operators might take these different approaches. And I started with Scott last time. Uh, Johannes, let, let's start with you this time. Yeah, thank you. So that's, let, let me start with the voluntary sharing. Uh, and that's, I think one has to see the context of sharing in which sharing takes place. Uh, because uh, let's say that the sharing of, of active and passive uh, uh, capital assets can reduce capital expenditures of an operator and operating expenditures of an operator, there may be uh, an incentive voluntarily to, to share uh, infrastructure. Uh, and I think, why then do we see regulators impose mandates? And uh, I think there's two reasons for the, for the latter model. One might be, uh, one might be that, that the, there's concerns about the competitive structure of the market, right? I mean, the, the voluntary model works best if we have a competitive market environment, where at least we have workable competition. That doesn't necessarily mean four or five competitors, but probably three is, is, is in, 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 in those uh, high cost uh, intensive areas is probably already a workably competitive structure, especially if those, the providers are sort of, 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 of comparable size. Um, but that you know the, what what is workably competitive can vary from from case to case. In those situations, right, the the voluntary uh, model is works very well because operators realize they can reduce those costs, they can stretch their investment budget to provide uh, higher quality services or or, or expand uh, the area that is uh, feasible from based on market forces. However, if you have uh, a monopoly in place uh, or, or the competitive structure is very concentrated and, and you are worried that the dominant operator might not uh, offer fair sharing uh, arrangements or might even want to not share at all because they think they could sort of dominate that market for a long period into the future, maybe there is a scenario where regulatory intervention might make sense. Um, The, the historical experience, and I think we'll come to this in more detail, but let me, let me just allude to a couple of points. In, is in general, I think that the voluntary model is preferable over the, the mandated model where possible, right? Because it enables the parties who are familiar with the market situation, who are familiar with the, the customer needs and so forth, and the technology to really negotiate a, a custom agreement that that enables them to, to be more efficient and offer those services more efficiently. And if you know, as soon as you bring regulation into the picture, now you have a regulatory agency uh, substitute for the judgment. And th there's always the problem of, of, of asymmetric information between a regulatory agency and somebody who's on the ground. And, 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 and I, I don't want this to sound uh, in any way negative or derogatory, but that's a challenge. It's not the, with the best of all intentions and the best of all 
uh, uh, information available that regulatory agencies had in the past, sometimes that external intervention led to poor choices, right? And so for example, in the US case, that unbundling solution that was adopted after the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was not workable. We, we realized uh, very quickly that, that the intended goal of, of, uh, of, of stimulating a transition to facilities-based investment in many cases didn't work. Likewise, in the European Union, um, uh, in, 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 in the case of broadband access, right? I mean, they've clearly after, after years into the experiment, people realized that the model didn't work as well as, as had been intended. I'll say more about, about how exactly the model work differently from the anticipations. But so this, this external regulatory intervention has the risk that we, we, we also introduce unanticipated side effects that we don't really know at the time we make the decision. Yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, first, the, the difficulty of the information. I know when I went from being a regulator in the US and went to work for a telecom company, I then understood what I did not know as a regulator, but I was also impressed how little I knew as a company person too. Uh, I thought companies knew everything, but uh, that wasn't the case. We struggled with information as well. So, all right, very good. Uh, Scott, what are your thoughts? What, why is it that sometimes operators do this voluntarily and sometimes they push back pretty hard? Um, right, I, I, I agree with what, uh, with what Johannes was saying and of course with what you were saying, Mark. Uh, and you know, just uh, to follow up a little bit on the asymmetric information problem, uh, you know, of course it's, it's, it's it, it, setting these prices um, and understanding the, the costs of, of providing the infrastructure and the services, it's, it's, it's a matter of asymmetric information, but it's also uh, that there isn't one right way to, to, to do that and to divide costs. Um, there, in, in when it's a regulatory mandate and we're trying to figure out what the costs are, the incumbent will always argue that you should include lots of the fixed costs, for example, um, and say that their costs are higher and so that therefore the rates to, to, to next should be higher and then vice versa. The, the retail operators will say, no, 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 we shouldn't be responsible for those fixed costs or at least not as much of them and they'll argue for lower rates and then it's up to the regulator to decide and the regulator has to try to decide when there isn't a single right answer. Um, and so they'll always be subject to these pressures with really not a way to decide that there's something right. Um, and it's, you know, of course it is always the, uh, the regulatory mandate that's uh, controversial. There's rarely controversy in a company deciding that it should, should share and, and offering it to, uh, to other companies. Um, but there's also, you know, there's in, when uh, deciding on that policy, there's a dynamic aspect of it too. And you're thinking about how it will affect service now versus in the future. So if there were no future uh, and we lived right now forever, um, you would, you would want to share that infrastructure with everybody. You would want to get the maximum use out of it as possible. Uh, let everybody offer retail service, compete to get the price down. Um, and you just wouldn't worry about what happened tomorrow. But of course we do worry about what happens tomorrow. And so generally speaking, the goal of infrastructure sharing has been uh, to create retail competition along the way to creating um, infrastructure competition, facilities-based competition. And uh, so if that's, you know, then the, the, if that's the goal, then you move to what, um, what Johannes was saying, how well does it, uh, does it promote that? And deciding what your, you know, what, what your discount rate is, is, is hard. How do you value the present versus valuing this um, future investment? And it, it, sometimes the decision is easier than other times. In the US, we had um, two very well built out sets of infrastructure. Uh, wire wireline infrastructure, uh, the telcos and, and the cable companies. So we already had some infrastructure-based competition, uh, and so it was easier to say, okay, we've got these, we've got these two, these two, uh, these two technologies competing with each other. Let's go. In Europe, where they did not have such a widely built-out cable system, it was harder because they started from a point of not having any kind of competition. Uh, so it was a, I think it was a, a much harder uh, decision to say what was the right way to go there than it was here. All right, thank you. So both of you are, um, are scholars. You've, you've not only gone and, and done work, you've, you've sat back and studied it, read other people's studies as well. And if you've already answered this and in, in what you've said already, just say so. But I was wondering, Scott, I'll start with you. 
is there anything from the academic literature, literature, the scholarly literature, that the studies that have been done that shed some light on these infrastructure sharing issues? Yeah, I mean, there has been a, a lot of research on it. And, and I think generally the research shows what, what, we, would, what we would expect. Uh, in the short run, you can see lower prices from infrastructure, uh, uh, mandated in, mandatory infrastructure sharing. Uh, and in the long run, you see an effect, uh, a, a, a redu an effect of reduced investment as a result. Um, so the incentives seem to go, uh, the, they go broadly the way we would expect them to. Uh, and so that's, that's not really surprising. Um, to throw another little twist into it, though, um, is uh, when you think about how much people value different speeds. This makes it more, more complicated. So we have this idea that everybody wants gigabit speeds and so on, but it's actually not, not true. Um, and so if people tend to be actually happy with lower speeds, how does that affect your decision between promoting uh, investment versus using your in more infrastructure now? Uh, and I have not seen anything like that incorporated into the literature. I'm not exactly sure how you would do it. Um, but, but it's another thing that factors into, the, um, uh, in, into this question of, of dynamics and, and how, you, you know, how much you want to uh, value, value the future. And again, the, the answers might differ in different places. Okay, now... You, you might not remember the articles well enough, but you mentioned something about in the longer term, there's less investment. Somebody might argue that well, that's the idea. You, infra you share infrastructure, you don't need as many conduits, as many whatever there might be. So maybe that's exactly what should happen. Do you remember what the articles were finding, that it was a cost saving or that it was just people not being willing to invest so much into the future? I, I think, I mean, but you're right. It's thinking about it as um, in just terms of amounts of money isn't really exactly the right way to go because we care about outputs, right? Um, and you know, I believe we, you know, over time you do see uh, less, not just less investment in terms of money, but less investment in terms of what is the next generation uh, infrastructure. So there was you know more investment in fiber where there was not, where there were not, uh, where there, where infrastructure sharing was not required, for example. Okay. All right. Thank you. Giannis, what about you? Uh, what, what have you seen in the literature that sheds light on these issues? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. Right? And, and we, of course, we hope that, uh, that um, our empirical and our research in general helps us make uh, uh, good decisions. I would, I would distinguish between three types of approaches in studying this network sharing issue. Uh, and, and they come in at different stages uh, in, in the discussions, right? I mean, the first one is, is theoretical analyses, kind of, right? I mean, because sometimes we, we, it's, an, it's an experiment that we plan to do. We have, we have a new technology, we have a, a, a new challenge. There's really no historical observations other than metaphorical observations, right? That, that where we had similar situations in the past. And so, so I, I'm an economist by training myself and an engineer, I think economists have, been helpful in, in, in building uh, theoretical and sometimes uh, experimental modeling environments where we explore how different uh, regulatory choices would influence investment, how they might influence uh, the speed of innovation, the direction of innovation. The challenge with these theoretical models is that they have to abstract from the complexity of the real world situation. And sometimes to such a degree that it's very difficult to say how, how transferable are those findings to our regulatory practice. But nonetheless, they give us uh, a little bit of a, of a roadmap. And, and in general, they, they sort of found uh, um, results along the lines that Scott uh, 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 emphasized, right? I mean, we, we see sort of short-term short -term, uh, benefits and then perhaps longer term effects on innovation behavior, on investment behavior, on, on dynamic economic effects that, that are less uh, desirable. Then there's a second class, and I'll be short, uh, of engineering models. And those are really helpful. So the engineers kind of essentially now come in and run simulation models. And, and, and they, the difference between the theoretical model and the engineering models is that they, they literally think through scenarios. They uh, come in with assumptions about the cost structure of certain uh, locations, certain technologies, about demand structure and so forth. And, and given our computational power these days, we can actually run very sophisticated analyses. And uh, they sort of, they 
ideally those engineering models would be inspired by the theoretical models because the theoretical models tell us how the, the suppliers, the users of, of, of services will act and how they will uh, tr uh, decide. And, and the best engineering models do exactly this. And these are really helpful because they allow to identify what's the potential cost saving uh, in, in uh, sharing uh, different types of infrastructure, different sharing models. The challenge with the engineering models is that they are essentially locking in this, the state of knowledge of today, right? I mean, we have, it's very difficult to anticipate where innovation might take us and how these things might change into the future. So, but as long as one keeps that caveat in mind, the engineering models are very, very helpful. And then the third uh, type of study is empirical studies. Now, empirical studies, unfortunately, we only can do after the fact, right? So frequently, by the time we want to need to make decisions, we don't have the results. Uh, as to as to as to could happen, what might happen, and but what we do see, and let me just give you a couple of examples here, uh, and and really try to sort of do like a high level summary. There's there's fewer empirical studies than we wish we had, uh, and and one of the reasons is that it's extremely difficult to disentangle the different factors that are in play when we look at performance outcomes. But uh, uh, a recent study by uh, Abate and others are. Uh, in Europe, looked at uh, let's say um, um, uh, like looked at the 4G uh, mobile markets, and they looked at uh, 33 countries and compared uh, in in a very careful, careful uh, executed sort of research design. They compared, among other things, markets that had sharing agreements and those that had no sharing agreements. And so what they found interestingly is uh, four-player markets without sharing had uh, in the performance indicators that they looked at in particular download speeds and upload speeds, they had the worst performance of all, of all national markets. Um, markets that had three players without sharing had the highest performance. And then markets with uh, four players and three players with sharing agreements were in between those two. Mm -hmm. uh, so so which, which the challenge right, with, with empirical studies is that looking at averages like they did, obfuscates to some degree that there's a, there's a strong variance, right? So if you look at the detailed observations, you see that there's some markets with sharing that do better than, uh, than markets without sharing, and then there's some markets with sharing that do much worse than others. Mm -hmm. And uh, nonetheless, the pattern, I think, on the average uh, suggests that sharing has a positive impact in some situations, but it may not be as effective uh, in achieving high performance as, as a well-designed uh, competition. And then let me give you another example quickly, because I think it's important uh, in the current discussion. And that is the, the experience with unbundling. And I've, I've looked at this uh, in, in, in for a long, long time in the, in the, in the US, but also in Europe. And, and so in Europe, just imagine you, you, know, you live in Brussels, uh, it's the year uh, 2005 or something, or 2003. Right, and you, you just designed a policy where you uh, uh, imposed by, uh, by regulatory mandate broadband unbundling uh, on, on incoming carriers. And what you see is that actually your uptake of, of, of second generation broadband or first generation broadband, I should say at that time, is, is, relatively, is relatively high, right? And it's actually faster than in other regions. And then, you know, fast forward uh, five years or, or 10 years uh, and you're again in Brussels and you realize that we are stuck in that first generation of broadband, right? We have, we have put a policy in place that uh, made it easier for carriers to deploy the old generation of, of, of access technology, but we have at the same time put a framework into place that reduced the incentives to move to the next generation. Uh, uh, that is fiber optical and, and other higher uh, generation uh, uh, broadband access technologies. And that's exactly what Scott alluded to too, right? The difference between the static, the short-term effects given technology and then the long-term effects. And so with the best of all intentions, again, the policy framework was put into place that overlooked that the longer-term effects could actually be undesirable. And you have seen in the meantime, right, Europe struggled to come up with a new fix to the problem that, that this transition was slower than they were hoping it would be. Yeah. And we can talk about the fix when we talk about regular the slide. <laughs> All right, very good, thank you. Um, I've just been paying so much attention to what you've been saying, I've let time slip away. 
So uh, we're going to move now to the, the participants asking questions. If you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat. I've got some more I'm going to keep asking until we get some there. So if, if any of you have questions for, for Johannes or for Scott, uh, please put them in the chat and I'll get them asked. We'll do that for about 15 or so minutes and then I'll turn things over to Samantha to kind of open up the mics and let you talk with each other, talk with them. Um, but one of the things that Johannes reminded me of is an experience I had a very long time ago when I was a regulator and someone pointed out, I was focusing on how do you do cost studies, measure costs in telecoms. And they said, they observed that when the economists do their studies and when the engineers do their studies, they tend to find you know, lots of economies of scale, lots of economies of scope, which means that firms should be large and they save money if they're large. But then when you run the real statistics, a lot of those effects disappear. Uh, and it's just, just demonstrating that a lot of times we're way too optimistic in our minds about what we can do. And then when we're actually trying to do it, the world's pretty messy. All right. Um, so uh, there are no questions there yet. So let, well, let me, if I, let me, um, rip, rip, I just want to um, sure, follow right. up on something that, um, that Johanna said, which I thought, well, you know, was, was particularly important when he, we, were, we were talking about the importance of having engineers um, working on it and the difference between engineers and, and economists. And, and it's, a, it's a good point. Uh, you know, different fields have different things to contribute to it. Uh, and, you know, engineers focus on what's possible and, and they want usually the, the best uh, setup because um, that's uh, the, the best engineering setup, the best technical setup. That's what they are. They're engineers. Um, and the part that uh, that economists, I think, can, can you know sh should be contributing. One part that economists should be contributing is the demand side of it. Uh, engineers focus on the supply side, right? And um, economists should help figure out what is the demand that we're trying to meet. How much are people willing to pay for what? Uh, and it's the you know it's it's the intersection of those two things that uh, that we care about. And that's of course one of the reasons why it's important to have both uh, both working on it. But I find that uh, it's hard to get demand into the debate. There just is not very much information on how much people value different aspects of broadband. Uh, I think the pandemic may be causing us to think differently a little bit about what it is we need and and um, and 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 what we what we don't. Uh, I think people are caring a little bit more about latency than they used to, uh, even though they might not think about it that way because we're involved in so much more real time uh, interactions online. Uh, but that's that's another important part of it, and you don't we don't see that as frequently as in, in regulatory decisions. All right, thank you, Scott. So I do have a question from Brian um, Estes. Uh, Brian asks, what U.S. state is a good example to follow in infrastructure sharing? And is that is it mandatory in that state? And if you don't have a particular state in mind, maybe just a, a situation. Um, you know, I'll open it up to either one of you that if you can come up with um, a state that you think has, has good infrastructure sharing. I, I assume you mean good mandatory infrastructure sharing. Um, yes, I think he's emphasizing <laughs> mandatory, yes. Yeah, that's that's hard. Um, you know, it, it's 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 easy. Wait, well, another part thing that we haven't talked about is uh, the difference between um, a sort of state-run wholesale-only network, which is another kind of infrastructure sharing, and um, that has not gone well in big situations. In Mexico, the Red Compartida has not gone very well, uh, and of course, the Australia's National Broadband Network. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm just stalling here, trying to think of, of a place where it has worked um, well. Uh, I don't know, maybe Johannes has an answer to that. Okay, Johannes, well, sorry I mean, to put me, you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me sort of uh, um, uh, give you a sort of uh, a generalized answer to the, the US state issue then, but then maybe maybe um, uh, give you another example. So, so I think the American situation is complicated in the sense that uh, the different types of infrastructure assets are controlled by different uh, uh, entities, right? So, for example, frequently rights of ways are controlled by by municipalities, uh, but then you have, let's say, roads and so forth that might be controlled either by the state or by the federal government, right? So, so, so 
so uh, it, it's, it would be very difficult to identify a state that has good infrastructure sharing policies because the states typically don't control all these assets. And let me broaden this uh, for a moment by saying the following. We, we didn't talk so far about types of infrastructure sharing that uh, do not necessarily or do actually typically not affect the competitive situation uh, in, in the telecommunication markets because uh, some of the very low hanging fruit of infrastructure sharing actually are infrastructure sharing across network industries, right? So, so for example, this notion of a dig once policy uh, uh, that if you, if you improve uh, a road, for example, that you also install uh, conduits without necessarily uh, contracting them to any particular providers. It's essentially that the, the notion of tower sharing of tower companies now for, for, for ducts and conduits along roads, or that when electricity companies upgrade their networks that they, sort of, uh, that they make available to other providers, uh, uh, maybe the opportunity to, uh, to use those rights of way for other networks. And, and because civil engineering infrastructure costs are so high in new network deployments, right, that can take off quite a, a significant portion of cost. And it can be done in a, in a way that is fairly neutral to the competitive uh, process in the, in, the, in the telecommunications industry. The challenge there is that you need different uh, government organizations or different providers, whether it's private or public providers, to coordinate those behaviors. And that's, very, that's a very difficult uh, uh, challenge to overcome. Uh, sort of these, these cross-divisional collaborations are difficult, at least in the US. There's a lot of uh, desiloing that would have to happen to, to, to do this effectively, but that's something maybe where other countries have, have a, a better opportunity to do so. The European Union actually has, I mean, I'm not sure who has followed this, but they in 2014 adopted a, a directive called the Broadband Cost Reduction Directive. And the idea was to uh, put into the regulatory discussion and into the national discussions, sort of a, a greater awareness of, of, of measures that reduce the cost of infrastructure. Or, and there's, it's quite a number of different provisions uh, some relate to this uh, cross infrastructure sharing model. Others relate to to access to to assets such as uh, buildings and poles of others. Uh, yet others relate to uh, uh, to uh, just transparency and so forth. And then uh, in the new European uh, Electronic Communications Framework that was adopted two years ago and is now sort of in the implementation phase, it has not been realized. Those provisions were also adopted, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion on on those different models. And although the European Union decided not to mandate those things on a regular basis, there is they put sort of legal boundaries around what individual players, whether an infrastructure provider can do, what a competitor can do. Uh, they put like a, a dispute resolution process in place, and. T to some degree, right? It's the it's the it's the it's the second best. Mo model to the dilemma that they faced after they got stuck in first generation broadband, right? Now there is the, the desire to, to speed up and accelerate the next generation of broadband deployment. And, uh, and, and so it's a, it's a more regulatory driven situation than perhaps uh, some of the other findings in our, in our empirical and in, in theoretical research would suggest, but it's a light touch situation, right? So it provides safeguards without uh, necessarily going into, into uh, the, the ne negotiation side, which is typically left to the commercial operators. And um, the challenge though is that, that once you have such a framework, right, you add another type of risk to investment decisions and that's the regulatory risk. Right? And there's always, if there's a regulatory framework in place, there's always the risk of regulatory recontracting. Right? Along the way, we, we change our mind, right? We, have, we tighten uh, the, the framework somewhat. But um, um, I think, uh, if I can just jump in for a second, Johannes raised uh, another really important point, uh, which is that when we talk about infrastructure sharing, we usually jump right to uh, how do you share the lines and how do you share the spectrum and, and the sort of the big exciting things. But you also mentioned um, you know, the, uh, the, the digging and, and the access to rights of way. These sorts of things are also network sharing. They're just boring, um, but they're really important. Uh, so like pole attachments is a big deal. Um, and I mean, you know, there's no faster way to put people to sleep than talking about pole attachments. 
Um, but you know that's important for building out a 5G, um, adding service, especially in rural areas um, where everything's on you know above ground. Um, and there, it's 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 particularly hard because somebody owns the pole. Sometimes it's the city, sometimes it's the electric utility. It might be a telecom company, um, and then you want them to share that. But in this case, the dynamics is different because um, you're not promote, trying to promote investment in future pole technology. Although that's not, of course, quite true because tower technology has improved a lot. Um, and so then we get into these kind of endless debates about what are the real costs of, of attaching something to poles. And, uh, and, and it's, just, it's just hugely important. And it's, it may be more important for 5G build out than some of the other things we've been talking about. Yeah. So I have another question um, from Richard Clark. And um, after you talk about this, then I'll go move to uh, letting people have their, their microphones to, to ask questions. So Richard asks, um, as to voluntary sharing, there can be two general motivations. One is greater cost efficiency. The other could be less competition. And he wondered if you could disentangle those motivations just a little bit. Um, Scott, let's have you give that a try, please. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the, this answer sounds sort of trite, especially coming from an economist. But, um, you know, this it's, is an example where you want to let the market decide, right? Uh, it's It's hard to go second guessing why a company has chosen to share its uh, to share its infrastructure. Um, you know, I suppose there are there can be cases where it's done in some way to reduce competition, but I have not seen that. I mean, we like Johannes know, talked about um, historical examples and and there there were some in you know back when the telephone first was, uh, was first building out and, and some companies would make uh, no cost inter agreement. Uh, agreements with each other to, uh, to connect, um, interconnection charges, zero interconnection charge, but um, they, they may have done it as a way to, uh, to each keep their prices higher um, as just a coordination mechanism. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in terms of infrastructure sharing um, I have, and voluntary sharing, I don't think I've seen that. Uh, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's at least where we see any kind of competition, it's as a way to keep the costs down. I mean, they've got this infrastructure uh, often built out for peak uses where you're not usually on peak and you wanna find a way to get the best, use, uh, the best use out of that. I think the mobile example is really good because we have seen um, you know, this, these tower companies uh, grow and also improve on tower technology. You can add more and more uh, uh, antennas to the towers and the towers get bigger. Uh, and then those are uh, you know, actually not companies not owned by the the the, the, the providers um, and they're selling their own service so we see all kinds of <clears throat> all kinds of different sharing arrangements okay Johannes do you have any thought additional thoughts on yeah, so savings versus it's, it's a really interesting question uh, and and an important question right that the, uh, and it's probably a question that both regulators and, and competition authorities uh, will have an interest in, 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 in uh, commenting on it. My own take is uh, the following, uh, that uh, probably in most cases there might be mixed motives in place, right? I mean, it's, and it's hard to, I mean, if I were a manager and a decision maker, right, it would be difficult to disentangle those motives clearly in my own mind, right? I mean, because the, that my, the way the decisions I make about cost really influence my, my competitiveness and so forth. But I think what, what is meant is, is, it, is, it, uh, uh, is the intention to manipulate competition or disadvantage others. And I think the, the, the chance or the risk that this might be in place varies depending on what kind of infrastructure sharing we're talking about, right? If it's, if it's, if it's literally getting access to ducts and poles that somebody else owns, uh, may, maybe maybe that concern is, is is not in play really when it comes to the to the telecommunication side. If it's passive uh, infrastructure sharing, so let's say in the mobile case, it's sharing of of antenna uh, uh, towers or antenna sites or backhaul, uh, which is uh, for five G particularly could be expensive to build in areas, especially where you need sort of high capacity backhaul. I think the competitive concerns are less worrisome uh, because that's that these are not the parameters on which on which uh, uh, service providers compete. Mm -hmm. So, so generally speaking, I think the closer we get to active infrastructure sharing, probably the the the, the more more closely 
one would have to look at the potential competitive impacts. Uh, but even there, like in 5G, for example, and in other technologies, what has happened over the last uh, decades or so is that, that the, the value system has actually changed, right? We have, we have much of the value generations is now in the top layer of, of applications and services. And so, and, and, and the differentiation uh, happens at, at that level. And, uh, and even, even active uh, uh, radio network infrastructure sharing, for example, might not affect this too much, right? Because in 5G networks, you might be able to use off the shelf kind of standardized technologies to, to build your antenna infrastructure and so forth. And then the innovation really is the software defined uh, the virtual uh, sliced network that is on top of this one, right? So, so I think one really has to differentiate uh, the the type of sharing, the type of technology, and um, and in the end, at the stage of an agreement being drafted, I think one has to one can look at at the language of the agreement, the structure of the agreement, to discern whether there is a risk that competitive uh, impacts will be negative and undesirable, right? Probably not an, a completely accurate test. So what I would also recommend in any kind of sharing agreement is to establish a framework of review, of periodic review, because it will be the actions that are undertaken after these agreements are made that will, will tell a much clearer language, right? Whether it was indeed cost sharing only or the competitive uh, manipulation also. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to open the mic now, but before I do, let me uh, note, uh, so Mitchell Shapiro sent us a question about, um, about the, the Amon model. Uh, I may mispronounce that. And, and Mitchell, you'd emailed that to us earlier. I asked Johannes and Scott if they were f very familiar with that, and they're not. Um, they could talk for just a little bit, but uh, they're, they just not studied that very much. So I just wanted to alert you to that. So we've got some additional questions in the, t in the chat, but Samantha, I need to turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamison. Yeah, so um, as Dr. Jamison mentioned, this portion of today's session is where we would love to hear from our participants. So in order to do so, if you're using a laptop or a um, desktop, you would go to the bottom of your Zoom toolbar and you'll see the participant tab. There you would select the hand raising icon, which will then prompt me that you'd like to share with us. If you're using a phone or a tablet, that Zoom toolbar is gonna to be at the top of your screen and you'll follow those same steps. And I also included those directions in the chat for everyone to see. So as of right now, I don't see any hands raised, Dr. Jameson. So um, I'm not sure if you wanna follow up with the question that you had mentioned was in the oh, chat. So Mark, so, I mean, I can, I can uh, uh, with the provisor that you made, I'd be happy to comment briefly on that Ammon model because sure. it's a, uh, it's, um, It's sort of one of those very interesting experiments in my view, right? where you have a uh, kind of a wholesale uh, fiber network that is made available to others. But it, it is sort of in, in, in it structurally, it's very similar to what you will get in a 5G network where you can slice the network and have a wholesale ma market where you sell access to network slices uh, to others. And so there's the software capabilities of, of, of defining different, uh, you know, quality of service environment, different speeds and so forth. That's, that's, that's well developed and it's a, it's a relatively open network. Um, it, it's a case where all the relevant stakeholders got together and decided in investing in the, in the public open infrastructure. There's other cases across the U.S. Uh, where that works similarly. And, um, uh, but there's other in interesting features, right? For example, the, the consumers actually purchase, uh, purchase the, the, the part of the network that is uh, direct costs, right? So the last mile, so to speak, the, 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 the loop to the, to the house uh, is actually owned by, by the users. Uh, it's sort of amortized over, over a period of, uh, I think it's 10 years or something, right? And so that's, that's actually a model that has been suggested decades ago for the first time, why don't we let our end users own uh, the, the, the last portion of the network? So this would shave off costs from the, uh, from the, the core network, right? And, uh, and uh, so, so it's, it's sometimes, you know, the, uh, difficult to compare apples and apples because these models differ in, 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 in the organizational premises and in, in the way the 
structured financially, but it's a, it's kind of an interesting model of a of a publicly available uh, uh, wholesale network that can be used on an on an open access basis. And so let me just add one thing, and it's it's good that Mark um, pointed out that we're ignorant of this. So you know, any mistakes, of course, have already been caveated. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, without without knowing much about this model, the thing that I um, uh, that I, I worry about is that the, the actual costs, the true economic costs of building a network don't change regardless of how you distribute the costs. And sometimes, and I'm not saying it's true in this case because I don't know about it, sometimes um, these various financing mechanisms are done uh, in ways that hide the costs. And that's never good. Um, it's very hard to get uh, see the financials of, of most publicly owned systems. Uh, my colleague, Sarah O. Oh, recently did a paper on municipal broadband networks. And even though this wasn't the, the focus of the paper, one of the more interesting results I thought was that she was only able to even find the build out data um, for a or less than a third of the systems uh, reported to the FCC. That is the vast majority of these publicly owned systems didn't even bother to follow the FCC's rules on what they, you know, on, on reporting. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's always a danger, particularly once you're talking about the finances. And again, not talking about this network in particular because I don't know about it. Okay, Sam, you I mean, have... can I just say one more thing? It's because it's, it raises a, a tricky issue, right? That, that, that I, don't, I didn't want uh, to confuse here. And that is, uh, there has been a long discussion. I mean, I, I grew up in Europe, as I said, and sort of, uh, as, as, as I remember there, we had discussions on what's more efficient, public, private, uh, municipal, right? And so forth. And, uh, and th in my view, that's kind of a, uh, that's a, not a very fruitful discussion, right? If you look at averages and things like this, uh, uh, and uh, the, you will find examples of, of public networks that are extremely inefficient that have failed. Uh, you'll find examples of, of private networks that, are, uh, that have failed, right? And so frequently it's a question of who carries the risk, right, in, in, in those projects. And so I think, I think the more, the more, reasonable discussion is how do how do sharing agreements uh, affect uh, infrastructure deployment right how do they affect the the costs of the care and and how can we do it in a way that that uh, that assures uh, the highest quality of service to individuals and and, and to users okay all right so uh, we need to move on to another topic Sam someone has their hands up but for those of you watching the chat there's an active debate going on there as well so lots lots going on. Sam? Thank you so much. Yeah, so it looks like we have Shernan's hand raised. Shernan, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Just let me know when you can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Hi, thank you. Yes, I did put something in the chat. Maybe you can just read it and then I would like to hear Scott and also Johanna's um, thought on that. Um, most of the times when we talk about um, infrastructure sharing in the Caribbean and also parts of the of Latin America, we are referring, our people are referring, regulators, they are referring to one single wholesale um, network. So it's not really like um, focusing on, let's say, um, passive um, network sharing like towers and antennas, these kind of things, but they are focusing most of the time on one single wholesale infrastructure. And I've been looking at, at this topic for, for a while um, there are some papers out there from GSMA. Um, I think in Europe, they do have a, a, a report on that as well, entitled Facility-Based versus Service-Based um, Competition. And what, what, what I would like to say is uh, most of the times when regulators or countries, let's say, come with this particular approach, they are trying to solve um, one specific um, problem. For example, you may have problems in, um, in a rural area or underserved area, and then they will, or they think if we come with one single wholesale infrastructure and then let others um, connect to that um, wholesale infrastructure, then they can solve that access problem that they are facing. But all of these models that I've seen, and also the Red Compartida in, in Mexico, that is the, the latest one, basically, none of them um, did, uh, let me see, uh, none of these models were able to achieve the same benefits that full-fledged facility competitions competition bring. So um, 
I would like to hear your thoughts um, on that. Um, it, it goes beyond just, let's say, um, um, infrastructure sharing. It's, it's a discussion regarding facility-based versus service-based um, um, competition. And what I have seen so far, um, when it comes to competition, when, when you have one single infrastructure, it didn't, it didn't, um, it didn't achieve the, the, the goals that people thought they, were, they, they will achieve. So please, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting you bring up Red Compartida uh, because that also, of course, involved huge government subsidies in, in the sense that it was given all the spectrum basically for free. Um, and then there was a, a, um, a somewhat controversial um, RFP, a company's bid to provide the service. And you're right, it has not panned out. People have complained about it when they, when they say they don't offer a lot of information. Uh, and when they say they've met their goals, you dig into it and realize they've met their wireless goals by renting space on um, America Mobile's uh, tower uh, spectrum and equipment, which is kind of interesting since they were supposed to be the wholesale one, but instead they are buying some of their access wholesale. Um, so yeah, so those those systems have not have have not really worked out uh, have have not worked out well. Um, and again, uh, when when you're talking about the uh, in, in particular areas where there is is not service, and so you're trying to figure out find ways to correct those problems. It's, it's still always about trying to find a way to cover those costs. And um, if, somebody's, if somebody's building out a network and then selling retail on it, either that somebody is going to be the government, in which case it's subs subsidized, um, or the price of retail is going to, the price that, that uh, the retail operators pay the owner of the infrastructure is going to have to be enough to cover those fixed costs too. Um, so, you know, I, I don't see that wholesale or resale is uh, a solution to, a, to the rural problem of, of uh, to, a, to a high cost problem, because, uh, you know, un unless you can find enough providers that are somehow able to share all the fixed costs, uh, and I don't know that we've seen any good example of that. So can I, I mean, can, may I add to this? I mean, for one, um, I'm I'm very skeptical about sort of um, models where you where you um, um, mandate or or invest public funds into a wholesale model in areas where, where competition is possible. Right? I mean that's th th there have been experiments, you know, over over the decades, right? And, and um, th although there's no 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 study that I'm aware of that looks at all of them, right? I mean, there's there's a whole long track record of, of, of those models uh, in the end failing. And one of the reasons is is that um, the, it may be possible right, to invest in an infrastructure that is that is least cost given the current sort of uh, demand structure and technology, right? I mean, you know, a perfect plan I would be able to do so. But what competition adds uh, that a planner cannot add is sort of innovative solutions and, and different solutions and new business models and new uh, new technology solutions. And as, as time passes, right, it's very difficult to see how those those uh, uh, large scale open access infrastructures can achieve that same kind of uh, the same kind of uh, uh, dynamic updating. So so I think innovation uh, is a very very strong reason why we want competition and why. Um, uh, these models often don't work. Now, so the sharing, I think, in, in some sense, is, is more important uh, as we go to uh, beyond those areas where, where competition works uh, really, really well, right? Because then the, maybe there's ways to rationally reduce costs. But some of the cost reductions really depend on, on the different players collaborating efficiently right so if, if the if the community is unwilling to to play its role let's say by making uh, making rights of way available uh, maybe private uh, providers will not have uh, uh, you know the 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 opportunity actually to to exhaust all the sharing potential but in the end I mean I agree with Scott right? I mean that 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 the the, the efficient cost of providing uh, network and services through all areas should should be independent of whether they're sharing or not sharing it. And I mean, I'm not sure whether any of you remember the book by Brown and Sibyl in 1986 on public utility pricing, right? Where one of the arguments- Keep it by was, my bedside. Hmm? I keep it by my bedside. 
Yeah, <laughs> okay. But sort of one of the key points that is frequently forgotten is exactly what you said earlier, Scott, is that, that there is no economically efficient single way to allocate joint and shared costs. Right? I mean, there, there is, there is, uh, the, and, and networks always have shared costs. Uh, that that need to be somehow um, addressed, and so maybe that's that's where, where the, the the sharing comes into play. I think, as I said before, technology helps us, right? Because competition increasingly is is on the on the on the highest level of the of the of the value stack, and uh, and um, hopefully that'll that'll be a, a good boost from an innovation perspective. All right. So Sam, you said you have two hands raised. We've got four minutes, so let's deal with both of the hands. We'll run a little bit over. Um, if Scott or Johannes have to leave, just wave your arms and let us know. Yeah, I'm going to have to drop off at 11. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. So we'll let you start on one of the questions, then we'll wrap up. Okay, so I just asked to unmute uh, Rodine. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've been enjoying it again. Um, I, I just wanted to, I, you know, when it when it comes to to infrastructure sharing, um, for me as a as a regulator, is to help reduce the cost um, that is um, spent by the operators, and at least to be able to spend more money on the infrastructure to roll out, especially to unserved areas or to the rural areas. Um, once I came with a I came with uh, an idea, or and then you know discuss it with um, some of these um, operators. That is um, bringing, for example, four operators together. Uh, each of them will chip in something. Of course, they would have done you know a study of knowing how how much it will cost you know for a base station in a particular unserved area, and you know four of them will you know chip chip in equally. But then the problem was um, uh, which of the four operator is going to be assigned. To do the installation or to roll out and after installing everything and it's working how does the others get their, their their share if you you know if you would call it that way either from the calls or you know so that was that was something like a sticking point you know i would like some maybe uh comments from you know the guys at the table on that aspect how are these four operators going to share you know the the revenue or the out put or the outcome of that so that, you know, all of them would feel at least, you know, getting what they should. Thank you. All right, Scott, we'll start with you since you've got to run. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a really hard question. You're trying to make them uh, operate together in a way that they seem to like they don't want to. I mean, I, I guess, uh, I, I, you know, as a, basically as a way to dodge the question, um, I wonder uh, what other mechanisms have been tried to reach these uh, reach these areas that where I, I'm assuming it doesn't make any economic sense uh, to provide provide service. Uh, you know, nor, normally in most countries, not most many countries have some kind of universal service fund, um, and then uh, you know now it's very common to do some kind of reverse auction uh, to for subsidies to provide it, and so then that's you know that's one way you get them to compete against each other for the subsidy. Uh, then to build out, you don't have to worry about how they share the the revenues. Um, you know, obviously, these I mean, the, the problems are harder. This, you know, in some ways, harder the smaller the country is. Um, where did the revenues come from, and, and so on? Uh, the, the the subsidy. Where does the universal service fund uh, revenues come from? Uh, but I think I, I don't know. Trying to find ways for companies to cooperate. Uh, I, I don't know how that works in, in the long run. I would rather see them compete up front um, mm -hmm. and possibly, you know, renew that competition over time. Okay. All right. Scott, I know you have to leave. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Thanks, Scott. Bye. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Okay. Johannes, what would you add on uh, Renee's question? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's it's a really a uh, 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 good question and a very, really important question. I mean, we we haven't talked about uh, about sort of different ways how uh, these sharing uh, solutions could be organized, right? I mean, we we essentially talk about sharing in, in the abstract, but there's 
uh, as you all know, there's multiple models how you could be done. In some cases, we see uh, joint ventures, right, uh, where sort of uh, an infrastructure is built as a joint venture between uh, the operators that are uh, involved. And then there is sort of a kind of a uh, essentially in uh, a, a wholesale price, right, that is assessed by by the joint venture partners, but potentially also by others who want access to that infrastructure. That that would be one model. That um. Uh, I think from a from a uh, business strategy perspective, a joint venture is more difficult to negotiate. Uh, it it also from a from a regulatory competition perspective, uh, it's also from a business perspective uh, less easy to to modify going forward. Right? I mean, there's a lot of uh, rigidity here. From a regulatory competition perspective, it perhaps is is the the model that that might raise more concerns. Uh, where sort of this uh, this uh, the, the risk that maybe this is it's being used to to uh, reduce competition as, as one of the questions was before is 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 something one would, needs to look at very carefully, but you also have like a reciprocal access model in some cases where maybe one operator owns one one part of the infrastructure and another one owns another. Uh, you know, a lot of the the current network technology is actually such that that the that the economies of scale uh, are high, but they they occur at the level of the entire system, right? I mean, they don't necessarily occur at the level of an individual component. So it's possible that uh, a, a patchwork of, of operators puts together a network that overall has high economies of scale, but in each individual component, right, you, you don't see those. Uh, and so it's like the internet, right? It's a, it's a network com uh, constructed of 66,000 sort of uh, sub-networks that, that overall have enormous economies of scale. Um, and then lastly, you have a, like a, a one-way access model. And I think in all these cases, the, 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 the fewer sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the number of organizations that provides that, that infrastructure component, whichever it is, right? maybe the, the more concerns has to be uh, uh, addressed to, to reviewing the, the agreement and then the pricing, right? And so one, one, uh, one simple rule that regulators could adopt without necessarily getting into the, the, the details of the agreement is, is something like a, what is in, in trade theory called most favored nation clause, right? So you say, okay, you agree on something, but you have to make the same conditions available to third parties. Uh, if, 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 if that's something that you, that you impose early on, right, I think some of the, the, the competitive concerns potentially are much mitigated in my view, right? It would be more difficult if, if you wait a year or two and then you come up with such a rule, right? Because now you have regu changed the regulatory uh, system and, and, uh, and your players will kind of anticipate maybe there's some regulatory risk and, and that might work against investment and, and efficiency and so forth. So, I don't think I have answered your your question directly, right? But I mean, that's sort of the things that I would I would I would uh, 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 take into consideration. All right, thank you, Sam. We had one more. We do, yes. And please forgive me if I am pronouncing your name incorrectly. I, I do apologize, um, Adamu. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Just let me know if you can hear us. Yeah, um, hello, I can hear you, Samantha. Thank you so much uh, for the interesting session. Uh, I've actually learned a lot in today's session. Um, Oops. The architects, the infrastructure. Um, I, I, can, I, I cannot uh, hear you. Uh, Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? It, yeah, it's very hard to hear you. Can you hear would you, me? Now, would you be able to um, submit your question via the chat? That might be easier, and then we can get back to you, but we can't hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll send my question via the chat. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't look like we have any more hands raised at, at, at the moment, Dr. Jamison. Okay. Um, so why don't we, Sam, because uh, it may take, take him a little bit to, um, to
to send in his, his question in the chat. Why don't we send him an answer to it? Sure. Um, yeah, I think uh, and that does maybe there's one or two more questions in the chat. So we'd be, I'd be happy to help draft an answer or something. Okay. Yeah, just right. call we'll, me. We'll follow up then. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you're, okay. you're the, the distributor of, of questions if needed. <laughs> All right. Very good. Okay. So, um, so let me just thank everyone for being here. Um, Johannes, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom. And we appreciate people's participation.